Ah, uh, Roblox. We meet again. Well, it seems as though the video I made on Phantom Forces did quite well, as in statistically 40 times better than anything else on the channel, which probably means people want to see more of it. With Roblox's immense popularity and community, there is many an FPS to be played aside from Phantom Forces, a fact most comments brought up. So if I could catch lightning in a bottle once, then why not try to catch it, say, I don't know, two dozen more times? By talking about every Roblox FPS game mentioned in the comments. There's a couple of these I've heard about before, like Bad Business and Black Hawk Rescue Mission 5, but for the most part, this is a truly blind dive into some potential masterpieces. A good thing about the Roblox game creation tool's relative simplicity is that it allows games to have drastic differences in mechanics, visuals, you name it really, while still having around the same range of system requirements, which is a hell of a lot less than a new COD or Battlefield. Oh no, so you didn't shoot you on that bait! I can't say my expectations are overly high, but Phantom Forces defied the odds against its slop blocks brethren, so who's to say that some of these can't do the same? I'm not going to be covering all of these in one video, of course, as an act of respect towards what little remains of my sanity. Instead, this video will serve as part one of two. That way I can talk about any new additions from the comments. After a quick shuffling selection, I have a finely curated list of new experiences to explore. Helmet, Deadline, Bad Business, Rivals, Recoil, Frontlines, Centara, Scorched Earth, and Glare. And not Whizbang, because I don't know what the fuck he was yapping about. Keep in mind that this examination is not nearly as in-depth as the one on Phantom Forces. Whatever new gimmicks or modes or what have you that are only available to people who have invested a solid amount of time into the game probably won't be discussed. Not to say that it's an unfactual review, just less informed. And it's still going to be in the same format of what is the game, how are the guns, how are the maps, and so on. With that being said, it's time to eat, sleep, game, and repeat. <laughs> For the first game to talk about, Helmet did not disappoint. It's not technically a first-person shooter game, considering the point of view is coming from a helmet cam instead of the player character's eyes, but it's just too slick to not talk about. There's not much to it at the moment, a tutorial, three missions, and a relatively bare-bones multiplayer mode to be specific, but it's still an alpha, so that probably won't be the case in a year's time. The menus have this computer UI and media player aesthetic that genuinely tricked me the first time I played, and it helps kind of sell the idea of this being helmet cam footage you are accessing too, I guess. The general story of the mission starts with you awakening in and escaping from a Nusian base with your squad mates. You know, if you have friends. By calling in to Pancho, who seems to be a higher ranking officer that left you here. After blowing up a Dominion anti-aircraft missile system, you get a Hilo evac and move on to your next mission investigating a spice mine. Oh, and a gigantic mech man who can only be taken down by several improvised explosives also. Kill muties, behead muties, slam dunk a mutant baby into the trash can. After that, you hunt down a man named Zoe and discover a teleporter in the process. You destroy it, and probably something else that I will eventually claw my way towards seeing. Fair warning for solo players, this game is not kind. Helmet is a game all about approach, and more specifically, how running and gunning is usually the wrong one. No matter the difficulty, three or so well-placed shots is enough to take down your enemy and you. If that is an enemy in front of you. Mixed in with the armed guards and soldiers are workers, press and captured civilians that you are penalized for shooting. Shoot enough of them and you fail the mission. You can intimidate civilians and guards by pressing F to make them surrender. Shooting them after they've surrendered takes another point off, so be careful about the ones that switch between running and surrendering after you start shooting. If you're unlucky enough, they'll even lunge at you and take a chunk of your health unprompted. Gadgets have a lot of importance to you in Helmet. Things like lockpicks and zip ties are essential for any remotely silent attempt. Flashbangs and stimulants are good too if you want to take a slight edge off the difficulty. Weapons are what you're going to be feverishly waving around whenever you're not using your gadgets. But in case you've forgotten, an unsuppressed gun is in fact loud as all hell. So anything outside of quiet weapons like the N2A1 suppressed rifle and silenced pistols, you should reserve them for either loud encounters or when and only when it is necessary to put 16 individual pellets through a man's forehead for self-defense. If you feel confident enough in your marksman capabilities, you can abandon your secondary altogether, swapping it out for a piece of gear like an ammo box or a camera. 
The maps aren't half bad. They're made with a lot of tight corridors and corners in mind, which is perfect for this kind of game. I believe there's only a couple multiplayer maps at the moment, and they're good enough. Mostly tight hallways and unsuspecting corners, much like the campaign maps. If you play a couple missions, you can start unlocking perks in the skill tree. Anything from specialty weapons to increased intimidation factor to literal clairvoyance. It's not necessary, an awesome addition for sure, but you'll have to complete a mission or two to earn a perk point, and the minimum points for a perk is five. So a proper time investment is required to really start having fun. It's a great premise with a solid execution and an actual story. I played a bit of the multiplayer mode too, and if you want to play CSGO with the GoPro equivalent of tank controls, then be my guest. But man, I don't find the gunplay all that fun, to be honest. The helmet cam being your POV and the way that affects what you can see is really neat, and the motion is fluid. I like the idea of the more natural motion you have when moving around, where your gun kind of has its own center of gravity and swings around with recoil and movement to mimic a somewhat realistic usage. But having that at the same time as an off-center perspective makes it a bit of a bitch to get through your firefights when your robotic enemies don't have the same issues with precise shooting. Now, in all fairness, it allows up to three players in a mission, a benefit which I did not have, so if it intends for you to have two other people helping you, then the strangely harsh difficulty ramp makes a lot more sense. And it's not exactly an issue in multiplayer, as you're now fighting real people with the same problem. Most times, it's a good kind of nerve-wracking, but sometimes, it's just frustrating. There's a slight randomization that affects this difficulty ramp too, where doors, rooms, and hostiles are shuffled around the designated map area. Though oddly enough, it seems to actually change every time you restart, regardless on if it was from the start or not. It certainly serves to work against you, considering you can never fully rely on muscle memory from previous attempts. The graphics aren't even that much different from the plasticky standard of Roblox, but the slight griminess to the textures, good lighting work, and digital fuzz overlay, presumably from the camera feed, make it feel a lot more detailed than it is. The sound design is really good too, adds a lot of impact to kicking in doors and blasting fools with buckshot. The desperately gasping for air sound effect that plays on loop when you have low health gets a bit grating though. <laughs> Was that the bite of 87? No. And I do have one slight nitpick about how the sound detection can be a little jank sometimes. A shotgun boom can be less susceptible to being heard than you running down the same hallway you just executed a Vice News field reporter in. Uh, but there could be much bigger problems that simply aren't present in Helmet. I started enjoying this one a lot in all seriousness. If there was more content to talk about, this game probably could have been a video to itself. And I'd imagine the frustration of getting curb stomped in single player isn't an issue for the majority of people playing it. It's a refreshing switch up from a traditional FPS game that seems to be one of many in a rise of not quite first person shooters. First impressions are good. Let's see if it gets worse from here. For every breakneck, super fast paced shooter like Phantom Forces, there's a methodical and patience above all else shooter like Deadline. Weapon customization is incredibly in-depth. Literally anything you can think of modifying you can, and then some. Scopes, barrels, grips, mags, receivers. As long as you have the cash, that is. As a direct consequence, I'd imagine, there isn't that many weapons, mostly focused on assault rifles with a handful of SMGs and pistols, and as many sniper rifles as RPGs, also known as the American way. I'd mentioned shotguns, but at the moment of playing it and recording this, the shotguns are broken. Much like attachments, however, you have to pay for any weapon. There is levels in this game, but they seem to be more so for getting periodical cash rewards instead of unlocking weapons, because each one is available off the bat to willing purchasers. They range from two grand to 140,000, so I'd get to gambling if you want to collect them all, like cold, lethal, and unfeeling Pokemon. The maps are maps, and that's the best I can say for them. A lot of big spaces to walk around in for half your playtime. <coughs> the desert-ish town is good. That factory space or whatever the hell is not so much. One of the commenters that recommended this said it had fast-paced gameplay, and I'm pretty sure they either A, have played this game less than me, or B, just felt like fucking lying to me, because there's fast-paced encounters. 
but most of it is shambling towards the objective, while frantically looking around for scope glints more than a PTSD-riddled vet at a retirement facility. They've obviously taken some inspiration from Battlefield for map design, but forgot about the vehicles that make traversing those maps a trivial task. There's also this weird slowdown effect whenever you go through bushes and the like. I mean, I get it, you're supposed to be fighting through the bushes or whatever, but come on man, that's like eight assorted sticks. You should have no problem getting through that. Uh, you're, you're not, not that, that guy, guy pal. No. Trust me, you're not that guy. Game modes are point control, team deathmatch, and... I don't know, probably something else? The game modes that have a central objective to focus on work the best for this game, in my opinion. When both teams aren't being forced into a main area of conflict, it ends up with a 15 minute long team deathmatch round that's a series of prolonged cat and mouse games in a map that is at least two times too big. Now in defense of this game, I don't think I ever played on an entirely full server, so maybe a full party really does liven things up, so to speak. But what I experienced was tolerable. Deadline is a bit too slow burn tactical for my personal tastes. No offense to games like this and the bigger conquest modes from Battlefield and whatever else follows a similar vein, but I'd much rather a game where you're already exchanging bullets with the enemy in 10 seconds instead of quietly shifting up to the action for 5 minutes only to get sniped by a protege of John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> Animations are great at least, and there's a lot of effort put into the weapon mechanics too. Quick reload. Lean, hip aim, even night vision. You can get yourself an easy discharge from the front lines by inspecting your weapon's barrel close up whilst cleaning the trigger with your finger at the same time. <laughs> Surely it's not loaded, right? I did enjoy enough of my time with it to say it's worth a play, but not enough to say it's worth a second one. Ad Business takes the gameplay of Mach 10 maniacally paced first person shooters and says, we can make it faster. It's one of the few I actually have played for a bit before having it suggested to me, and it's all about the motion in the ocean of blood on the battlefield. That is to say, crouch sliding and bunny hopping are your new best friends. Weapons are plentiful, with more being introduced by the inclusion of a contract system in lieu of a conventional battle pass. It's mostly the shooter specials, nothing too extravagant save for some of the World War II and prototype pass guns. The customization is everything you'd need, but if I'm being honest, it doesn't matter all that much. Movement takes such precedence and combat importance that, save for maybe scopes and magazine sizes, the core goal with any weapon is jump around like crazy until you get in close, blast away whatever's in front of you, run away whilst reloading, and do a U-turn to do it all again. If you do care about the pieces of your potato head plastic gun, however, then there's no shortage of attachments. It functions pretty similar to Phantom Forces, where you can unlock attachments after reaching a certain goal or progress it using in-game credits. I only ever really used the red dots for scopes, because the advantages of higher magnifications on a weapon aside from snipers are made null by covering 50 square feet in half a second. Same reason almost any weapon that can get a stock or barrel cut down looks like it got jumped by a table saw whenever it reaches my grasp. Yo, she bitch. Let's go. <laughs> None of the guns feel that unique, though. Each gun category has a recoil, but the guns themselves don't, you know what I mean? Most guns I tried in a category had essentially the same recoil pattern, but mirrored or a bit more wobbly. Even then, saying weapon categories themselves have unique recoil is a bit of a stretch. The changing stat bars are there for aesthetic purposes, I swear to god, because I can put a short barrel on an LMG and it barely changes the recoil. Not that there's that much recoil to begin with. Even guns known for their killer kick end up feeling like pea shooters. All the maps are solid, that island one I like especially. The only map I actively disliked is that weird neon arena. And even then, that opinion would be different if it was like 15% smaller. All of them have a strong emphasis on levels and high and low points in the playing field, which goes perfect with the movement system. I can say with a good amount of certainty that they are entirely original creations too. They've even got Halloween versions as you've probably noticed by now. Game modes are the usual, team deathmatch, free for all, as in solo deathmatch, king of the hill. Patrol is a take on a VIP mode that feels like it'd probably play better as part of a player versus everyone else mode, but was still fun regardless. For bad business especially, I tend to gravitate more towards game modes like team deathmatch because you can put all your focus into maniacally running and shooting instead of some meager objective. 
It reminds me most of an arena shooter from the 90s, like Quake or Team Fortress or something. And we are live here tonight on Days on Day Games, January 30th, 2015. <laughs> and has about the same visuals. Uh, not that I'm dissing it. It's perfectly fine and quite polished, just not next-gen realism or anything. Instead of having an on-screen map, you have a local threat indicator, which kind of helps sell this 90 shtick, but that's probably just me. Uh, the biggest problem with this game is that I'm not good enough to enjoy it. Really though, it's quite a blast and worth a shot if you don't want to think too hard about shooting moving pixels on a screen. If you're seeking a true test of skill and ability, then Rivals might scratch that itch. Instead of team-based or free-for-all matches consisting of a dozen or so willing participants of Warfare, Rivals puts you down to the bare essentials of a firefight. That being you, whatever you're carrying, and the man you have to kill. Because at the end of the day, long as there's two people left on the planet, someone is going to want someone dead. <laughs> Rivals takes a simpler approach to weapons, where you have one of each type of weapon with minimal customization limited to changing the weapon model, presumably to make the playing field as level as possible. Primaries include your mainstay assault rifles, shotgun and sniper, if you want to assert dominance over your opponent by decimating them with a flamethrower, bow, or equally outlandish weapon, that's always a possibility too. Secondaries are a pistol and Uzi, revolver, mini shoddy, flare gun, slingshot, and copyright infringement. And melees consist of your fists and a couple blades, including a motorized one. But all of these, aside from the default, require keys to unlock, which can be given as mission completion rewards, which also requires playing for a while. So I only played with a couple outside of the shooting range. The gunplay does in fact exist, and that's the most I can say for it. No discernible recoil to talk about. No super detailed weapon models or anything, but hey, it works for the game. Gunplay could use a lot of work, but for the weapons themselves, a variation or two of each wouldn't hurt, but what's there is perfectly serviceable. Maps are closer to a room than they are a sprawling land of battle, and that's a good thing. If these maps got any bigger, I'd be looking like Winged of Redemption, desperately searching for my far overqualified opponent. Why the fuck you stream that shit? It was your idea. <laughs> Most, if not all, maps are mirrored to keep things fair, and usually include a barricade or a ramp or other significant sightline disrupting object, for the occasional ambush of questionable success. Sure, the game is simple, but simple isn't bad if it's done right. For a game like this, I'd argue the simpler the map and core mechanics, the better, less ways for the enemy to surprise you and all. As for the weapons, a variation or two of each wouldn't hurt, but what's there is perfectly serviceable. Yo dog, we heard you like dueling, so we put duels in your duels. There's of course 1v1 duel, which is what you're going to be playing in almost every match, but if you and your Discord kitten want to roll some heads, then you can try out 2v2 duel, or 3v3 duel, or 4v4 duel, or 5v5 duel. Also, 1v1v1 and 2v2v2 duel. And if you really like this game, but literally none of the game modes, then free for all in deathmatch too. But playing them in this game makes me feel like the picky toddler eating chicken nuggets again. If you want a real twist on duels, then you can play Double Trouble, a 2v2 where you can use two weapons at the same time, growing a third arm in the process. I think the dual game modes with fewer people are the best, to be honest. By the time you're fighting a duel against two other people as you and they also have to simultaneously duel two other people, is it even a duel anymore? Besides, you play a game like this to test your skill. Not to test if your teammate's internet connection is good enough to survive the match. <laughs> the best way I could put this game is if you really like the Gulag matches in Call of Duty Warzone, and wish there was a game of just that, then boy do I have the game for you. For a game lacking in its weapons and features department, you think they'd pick up the slack with the movement, but it's nothing to write home about. You move fast, and the only advanced movement mechanic you have is a slide that immediately sends you gliding towards your enemy's gun barrel. As for my opinion of rivals, not the best, not the worst. Recoil is a straight up COD clone. From the menus, to the killstreaks, to the customization, to the playstyle. 
And here's a little secret about it. It's not as good as just playing an actual COD game. Guns are there, I guess. Plenty to choose from. Not that it matters much, though, when they all handle the same. You know you have to rethink your recoil system when you can fire a fully automatic Glock in a straight line. Ironic for a game called RECOIL! It doesn't take much to start raking in attachments and skins, at least. Presumably to keep your dopamine receptors running for long enough to complete a match. Didn't exactly stick around in this game too long to get familiar with most of the guns, though. At least they look pretty. Uh, I don't know. I'm tired of this, Grandpa! That's too damn bad! Maps are certainly a collage of shapes. I know for sure one is just a remake of Dust 2, so it wouldn't surprise me if like 110% of the others are remakes of other games' popular maps too. That's a big thing with these games for some reason. I guess it's because it's easier to have what's basically a map template instead of trying to create one that's somewhat balanced and sensical from the ground up. I'm almost certain I was only playing with bots. Not the good kind, obviously, considering the amount of kills I racked up. And in case you haven't noticed, I'm not that particularly good at FPS games. Either that or all the other 12 people playing it at the same time as I were literal toddlers. Game modes are both types of deathmatch, kill confirmed, and domination. The kill-based ones are fine if you can in fact kill, people seem to actively avoid the dog tags judging by the pools of them I could find, and domination has an odd capturing system where it takes like 5 seconds to take the point, so it's more like a never-ending 3-point relay race. If none of this interests you, then there's a, say it with me now, BATTLE PASS to unsuccessfully devote you to a life of gamer servitude. ENDLESS TRASH! I have no interest in playing this one again, to be honest. Most of the other games at least try to have a distinct element or gimmick to differentiate them from the games they're inspired by. But as mentioned numerous times already, Recoil is just a mediocre-er Call of Duty. I can't really think of a solid reason to play it, but I mean, I ain't gonna stop you. Just laugh in your face when you feel the burning shame of disappointment. Continuing the trend of COD clones, Frontlines is so close to playing it, it could be considered piracy. Why people discover they have a gift to make mountains out of a Bloxy Cola-flavored molehill and decide to make a carbon copy of an already existing game is beyond me, but I can't say I didn't like what I played. Guns feel good, although that's more of a compliment to Call of Duty than it is this game. There's seven primaries, three secondaries, one melee, one lethal grenade, and I'm pretty sure your tactical gear is actually just throwing away your melee so it could have a lot more substance, to say the least. Despite this, it still takes 67 levels total to get everything. Half the levels don't unlock anything, hopefully implying that there will be added content to fill those gaps. Attachments are unlocked from either kills, headshots, or cash, and they work well. Upper receiver and stock modifications can change up a weapon enough to pretend there's more of them than there actually are, with a much preferred distinguishable difference in stats. The many M4 conversions, for example. I don't even really need to go over the maps. You want to know what the maps are? Go to the COD Cold War wiki and click on the map section. Then have that. Then do it again. Yeah, this is another example of the early release maybe a bit too early. I mean, the maps look great, but when there's maybe four of them total, they run their course real fast. They are faithful recreations, at least. I can take my glasses off and squint, and I can almost imagine I'm playing the real Cold War. Until I'm violently kicked out of my nostalgia center after realizing the score streak button does nothing. Yep, that's right. A near one-to-one -one recreation of a game that's missing what's arguably one of the most important elements of the game it's based on. Oh, but don't worry, they didn't forget about the microtransactions. Game modes are, unsurprisingly, the base game modes from COD, so TDM, Kill Confirmed, King of the Hill, and Domination. TDM's fine, everything else is mostly alright save for the glaring issue of UI. There's no defined radius for tag collection areas and capture points, and you can't see how many tags you're holding at any given time unless you divert your focus towards the eeny meeny little circle. I know, I know, small nitpicks, really. But it's not that hard to implement, is it? The lack of different equipment leads to everything being kinda samey also, as nobody's gonna be experimenting with smoke grenades and flashbangs when they literally cannot. Think fast, chuckle nuts! <laughs> Compared to the rest of them, Frontlines looks the furthest away from Roblox, an effort to further bring it closer to Call of Duty, no doubt, but welcome nonetheless. It's a double-edged sword, though, as this game has a pretty pitiful amount of content compared to the others, style over substance and all that. I feel like this segment should be longer, but it would start getting redundant quite fast.
Centara takes a step away from the tactical conflicts of the 21st century and instead seeks to emulate a good old war game from the 2000s. The games, I mean, not the world wars. Weapons are alright, if not a little basic. One of each weapon given to all classes, with one or two more for each being unlockable with certain theater badges. The designated weapon also changes depending on which side and map you are on, but as far as I've noticed, this only affects the weapon model and reload animation. While there is basically no recoil, I'm not as worried about it in this game considering 90% of weapons are semi-automatic, but the lack of attachments kinda does whatever the opposite of sealing the deal is. The shotguns make up for it, however, by being sniper rifles of their own, and also being more fun than using a rifle for sniping. Because of the speed you can get running, and the tight building and trench based battles of some maps, melee rushdowns are a genuinely good strategy if you time your swings right. I didn't most times. There's eight classes to choose from, most only affecting which weapons you can equip. Riflemen, grenaders, and medics get a rifle, assault gets an SMG except for when they get a double barrel, officers get a service pistol and whistle, flame trooper a flamethrower, and mortar men a mortar. Some classes also get grenades, but you can buy additional equipment before heading into battle by spending points that you get throughout the match, I think? I never used them much because I wanted to save up points for the fun classes. Game modes include some type of point control and a larger multi-stage conquest. They play mostly the same as one another, run up, cap and keep a point, don't get killed, etc. Uh, like two thirds of the map are fought in the middle, as points on either side rarely get fully claimed for long. The other third is you getting decimated for trying to leave your trench. Visuals are okay. The gray textures and filters that give it that sort of aged and desaturated look are doing a lot of work, which the goofy-ass Roblox characters in Depictions of War are simultaneously undoing. It's an oddly fast-paced game, almost as though the default movement speed and settings weren't modified for more realistic conditions. It's a nice change from the typical grueling slog to your untimely demise. It says it's inspired by Battlefield 1 in its description, which it certainly isn't lying about. It has the class system, the map and spawning system, the built-in tinnitus from artillery shells. It does have a feature of its own, however. That being the ability to play the game in first or third person. It's entirely optional, but being able to switch to a wider perspective when you're trying to see where the next barrage of missiles are going to land as you're running headfirst into them is going to be more helpful than you think. It also actually had vehicles, which I found out for the first time when I turned a corner directly into an active tank. Major fracture detected. It's not half bad, all things considered. If you want to play on a bigger map but with smaller stakes than most 40 plus minute match World War 1 games, then this is a good option. If you're someone who cares about weapon progression and constantly unlocking things though, you won't get much out of this. While we're on the topic of World War Shoe, Turs, Scorched Earth serves as a slower contemporary to Centara. Gunplay is good, time to kill is in a sweet spot where it doesn't take a single shot to the pinky toe to down someone, but it also doesn't take three magazines and a half either. There's at least a weapon or two for every category you could think of, and I'd expect more as it leaves its beta stage. As for attachments, what little there is at the moment have rather high kill requirements, and are more for general playstyle modifications instead of light recoil adjustments and the like. Maps are mostly solid, the forested areas have enough foliage and structures interspersed to really make sure you keep an eye out, the urban factories feel grimy and desolate, and the big empty fields are what I would consider the weakest link. In theory, they should be the best maps, as you can fully utilize the destruction and creation mechanics, but the reality is hiding in trenches and tunnels as you slowly creep towards the next control point before popping your head up just a bit too high and getting it removed by a car 98k from 200 meters. You know. Like the real war. Hey, you. You're finally awake. The partial destruction you can cause with explosives and rocket launchers helps with that, and is a nice touch I didn't even consider. Although this is clearly another game meant to fill a similar niche to Battlefield, Scorched Earth picks up on some of the mechanics Centara didn't, like the ability to be revived on the field if a medic is nearby. Naturally, this feature isn't used much because no one wants to be the chomp running around reviving everyone, but it's a nice touch regardless. 
Another interesting touch is the building and digging mechanics. Along with combat-oriented items in your inventory, you also have a hammer and a shovel. The shovel can be used to dig out trenches and foxholes, really whatever quick cover from fire you need at the moment. And the hammer lets you build a structure from your list of blueprints. <laughs> the jack-o'-lantern. <laughs> from sandbags to wooden panels to full-size concrete pillboxes and the accompanying barbed wire. If you'd rather destroy people's sandcastles instead of digging your own, you can exchange the shovel for a sledgehammer and take out structures others have built. Almost anything can be damaged or destroyed with explosives. And classes like the Engineer get access to a big shovel to help with the digging process, while also getting double the points for creating things. Which is great for score streaks. The visuals are alright. The lighting is probably the best part, but the rest of it isn't stylized or polished enough to work as an art style rather than putting a spit shine on what was already there. Wait, fuck, I forgot to talk about all the classes. Uh, well, shot gets assault rifles, light ammo, discount, SMGs, and discount grenade. Medic heals and revives people. Engineer gets a special building tool and two times the build point. Demolition gets rocket launchers, AT rifles, and demo charges. Gunner gets a machine gun, and recon gets sniper scopes and range finders. <sighs> So there's an entire point system that dictates what you can equip and what time. If you go over the point limit, then you are not allowed to use any of it. But you can get a perk, and if you want more points, you can get a debuff your perks and buy. Glare is a rough-looking game with a lot of potential. It seems to be a passion project started over quarantine by a lone developer, so it even looking like this with a functioning alpha is impressive. Shit, it's better than some games at launch. Guns actually have some personality for a change. I customized my AK all around speed because I was expecting another glorified laser pointer and it kicked hard enough to dislodge one of my teeth in real life. But thanks to the very detailed attachment system, clearly based on Call of Duties, much like the rest of the game, uh, you can tone it down to your preference, with a downside in some other stats, of course. Glare uses a weapon system I can't say I've seen in any other game I've played. There's technically only about 15 weapons, but most weapons have all variations of said weapon platform. So an M16 can convert to a Colt SMG or LMG, for example. And you can mix attachments around on each blueprint to your exact tastes. Even select a weapon perk and change ammo type if the weapon can support it. Just a really dynamic system overall that gets a lot of mileage out of a handful of weapons. Grenades come in lethal and tactical, and there's unlockables for each category. Usually tactical will end up helping you more than the literal rubber ball grenade in your lethal slot. Smokes are great for hiding from snipers, but equipment is numbered, unlike your ammo. You can fire that all you want. Lockheed Martin is paying for all of this anyways. Kill streaks are here and high in kill requirements. I got a UAV and armor plates a couple times, but never the final kill streak. And I mean, they did their job? Uh, gold sticker? Yippee! Maps aren't exactly lookers, but are solid otherwise. None seemed too similar to one another to me, which is always good, except Nuketown. Something tells me it might be based on Nuketown. I like that some maps were noticeably larger than others, instead of each one being an interpretation of a thousand by thousand stud square grid. A lot of varied elevation, occasional issues with sightlines and the snipers that use them. Not sure if it was simply player bias, but Paintball, Nuketown, and that fort looking one were basically guaranteed picks. Apparently Mosh Pit uses larger maps, but I didn't notice a drastic difference or anything. Speaking of Mosh Pit, there are two game modes available at the moment. Quick Play, which has Domination, Deathmatch, King of the Hill, and Hardpoint, and Mosh Pit, which is a separate free-for-all game mode. At least that's what the description says. It's pretty much just a slightly bigger Team Deathmatch only game mode. Could have been a game mode in Quick Play, really. The progression bars broke sometimes, I swear, because a progress bar should not have more moving colors than a fucking lava lamp. And it seems, for deathmatch game modes at least, to calculate points off of the score you get for killing instead of a point for the kill itself. Unless people really are getting 4,000 kills in a 5 minute match. There's a little bit of jank with finer details, like the red dots not actually following the movement of the scope, and the visuals and animations are a little lackluster. But I'm a lot more lenient on this, considering it's a passion project and all. It's also reportedly entering its beta soon, so I'm interested to see what major overhauls would be happening there. A very promising project overall. Also, it already has FUCKING MICROTRANSACTIONS! The game hardly exists yet, you greedy capitalist dogs! I'm going to the one, one place that, that hasn't, hasn't been, been corrupted. corrupted by capitalism. Space! Thus concludes part one of our Roblox FPS foray. I'ma keep it real with you, 
I did not care for some of these. And the obvious thing to do for games that make you feel indifferent and or disdain towards them is to slap an incredibly biased but objectively presented ranking on them. Recoil is in D tier. Didn't really excel at anything or stand out to me, and there's plenty of other games worth your time. Tantara is in C tier. What it had was quality, but a gameplay loop that has a minimal progression through unlocks and the like is not one I can stick with for long. Deadline is in C tier, though I'm willing to admit this is probably a lot more of a personal opinion than the others. It's a technically sound game, with barely any issues, but man, it's just too tactical sometimes. Lair is somewhere between C and B tier. As I mentioned before, it has a lot of potential, but from what content is present at the moment, and what is clearly lacking, it just is not quite ready for a prestigious rating. Wherever Glare is, Rivals is right next to it. It's a functioning game that does what it sets out to do, but I didn't find it too special or anything. Like the white bread of dual games. Scorched Earth is in B tier. It has the special charm of a creation and destruction system, and good gunplay to boot, but like Centara, the visuals detract from the situation just enough to be somewhat distracting. Also a lack of sick-ass vehicles. Frontlines is also in B tier. I know I shat on Recoil for being a COD clone, yet Frontlines at least makes up for it by having some really detailed visuals and customization. If it had some original maps or mechanics, I could see this being a genuine alternative to a COD game. For the moment though, there's just not enough to give it a higher credit for. Bad Business is between B and A tier. It's a damn good game for the most part. I understand that movement is taking priority over gunplay, but I don't get enough satisfaction over the weapons and how they function to warrant an A tier. Helmet is a definite A tier. Unique gunplay and mechanics, a list of weapons outside of M4s and Glocks, an art style that somehow resembles Roblox and a AAA game simultaneously, a skill system that encourages replaying, the list goes on. I see little to no reason to not give Helmet an A tier. With a group of friends and some more playtime, this could quite possibly be an S tier. I'll admit that my opinion of Roblox has softened a little after playing all of these, but then again, maybe the fact that these were recommended to me means that I didn't have to sort through all the other dog shit first. Speaking of which, if you have an FPS game that I haven't talked about and isn't in the list for part two, then feel free to leave a comment recommending it. And, you know, like and subscribe too. It's interesting to see people with such incredible capabilities designing games for Roblox of all places. Perhaps there's more money in insert fucked Roblox game than I presumed. Who knows? I might come back to the games currently in early development stages in a year or so and see how much has changed. But for now, it's time to turn the computer off before the Roblox menu burns into my screen. Later, losers!